How's this sound? On your website, offer visitors something of high perceived value to them, but at a low cost to you. In exchange for their email address, they get it for free. Might be an ebook, a video full of helpful tips, a one off discount coupon. Over time, you build an email list of prospects that you can then communicate with on a regular basis. The result? More loyal customers, more sales, and the lifetime value of those customers increases exponentially. Sounds good, huh? It's a retentive episode 616 of the 13-year-old award-winning small business big marketing podcast. Well, I said, welcome to a small business marketing show, where successful small business owners share their souls to take your marketing straight to the lead. Now, here's your host, Mr. Tim Bowie. And welcome back to your weekly dose of Don't Go Anywhere Marketing. I'm your host, Timbo Reid, and I have an insatiable curiosity for uncovering marketing ideas that help businesses just like yours to grow. I do that through weekly in-depth conversations with successful business founders who have walked the path before us and for us, hopefully. You, infinitely more importantly, are a motivated business owner ready to crank out some great marketing to build that beautiful business of yours into the empire it absolutely deserves to be. As per usual, team, there is marketing G-O-L-D dripping from the ceiling over here at Small Business Big Marketing's HQ. So let's get stuck right in. A couple of quick updates. Remember that after each interview, I play a listener voicemail. Now, you might not get to that point of the episode. I hope you do. But if you don't, I just wanted to remind you that every week we hear from a listener about what marketing's working for them, a tip they've actioned from the show, some constructive feedback about how I could do the podcast better, whatever it is. And I encourage you to call me on 0480 015 150. That's the Small Business Big Marketing Hotline. You've got five minutes to leave me a message, leave your website address or at least business name for a bit of gratuitous promotion, and I'll play it most likely in an upcoming episode. 0480 015 150. Adam Robinson is the founder of retention.com a company laser focused on solving the number one problem marketers and e-commerce brands face today, growing, engaging, and reactivating their email database. You've got an email database, haven't you? Don't stress if you haven't. We're going to show you how to do that. In just two and a half years and with zero funding, Adam has grown retention from zero to $14 million in annual recurring revenue. Trust me, this bloke knows what he's doing. We cover plenty of marketing ground here, including why you need an email database and how to build one, the need for opt-in if you're in Australia. We have a bit of a discussion about that later on. And what I can confirm for all Australian email marketers and business owners, you must collect permission from the owner of an email address before sending them any communication. So basically, they need to opt-in. And that's important for a discussion we have further into this interview. Uh, We also cover if you have built an email database, you'll discover how best to engage with it on an ongoing basis. We talk about the role polarization plays in attracting and retaining customers. That's an interesting chat. Plus, Adam shares some great case studies covering all of the above. Now, I intended to kick things off by asking Adam how he became a retention expert. But we were quickly sidetracked when he mentioned just how much he paid for his business's domain name. Yeah, I don't think anyone considered me a retention expert till I spent 800 grand on that domain. Now everyone thinks I am. <laughs> I was going to say that. Before, well, talk to me about the domain because it's retention.com. It wasn't 800 grand, although it could have no, been. No, it was. It was. It, it was. was $800,000, yeah. You've got too much money, mate. Hey, man. I'm trying to do something <laughs> something big here. I'm trying to win this market. Before we talk about retention and how you become a retention expert, that is quite, I, I'm a little bit shocked. I did, when I saw your domain, I think, oh, wow, one word, you know, English dictionary domain. But not only that, there. not only Didn't that, think it's it w- perfectly descriptive of what our product does for e-commerce companies, right? So it's 100%. not it's not just like calling yourself stri- Stripe or, you know what I mean? Like drift, like it actually... <laughs> Perfectly describes the category of marketing that we do for our e-com customers. How do you work out at the time that in spending 800,000 US, 800, US dollars yeah. on a domain name, 
is going to, you're going to get that back. I'll tell you how it happened. So it used to be called get emails. Also very descriptive. We, our first product, it was just a script you put on your website. People hit the website. They didn't fill out a form. We would give you an email address, get emails. Amazing. Right. Uh, as we developed more products, that name was not perfectly descriptive anymore. And there's a lot, this is a, a nuance, but like for partnerships in the ecosystem that we operate in, get emails is a very aggressive name. Like you're kind of not supposed to be sending not first party opt-in consumer emails. So when there's a company that does that and calls themselves get emails, it's like, whatever. Now, retention.com, there is a much bigger narrative that doesn't involve that red flag sentence. That, that's, that's the core problem. It's like, as we got bigger, if the, if, if, if the name raises a red flag in the beginning, it's great. You know, as you get older and more mature, it sort of becomes a problem. I'm sold on the domain, Adam. I'm just amazed that you could see a return on spending 800 grand on a domain. I couldn't get a hold of this person that owned this domain. Like I, I just, you know, you, you go through GoDaddy or whatever a domain broker. Like I couldn't get a response. Um, I sort of, I have a friend who is in the domain space who was like, I can get, I, I can get it. I, you know, I can find this person. You know, there are these guys who operate in this world of very high priced domains and they're buyers and sellers and they've been for the last 20 years. And there's kind of like this range that certain names fall into, you know, depending on what spaces they can be used for, how good and descriptive they are. So basically this guy was like, look, you know, we'll try to get you. He's like. And it was a weird time in the market as well. Like everything was kind of melting down crypto. Like he's like this you know, watches, whatever it is. It's like domains, like wh- everything. Yeah. Was where, where, where does it fit? So <laughs> he's like, I think if it were me, I would pay 300 for this domain today. And if I owned it and um, as a domain trader, I would sell it for 500. That's kind of what I think that whatever. So I'm like anchoring myself to, and we have a nice cash flow business. You know, this is, it's it's not like I'm dropping 500 grand on like a party or something. This is something that I believe is like a, a, a 10 year asset for us at least. Right. Like, so amortize it over that period. I'd be happy to pay 15 grand a month or something to like be called retention.com. I can't even describe to you what it's done for us. It is just so amazing. How, how, do, you, how do you know that? Every single person that I talk to, it's like, I'm the hot girl, man. Like, you know what I mean? There's no other way to describe it. Like, <laughs> yeah. like people are like, it has it it has made it so much easier to recruit amazing talent. Every person that I talk to at a trade show looks at me in a different way. It's like it's like I lost forty pounds, and all of a sudden I'm six foot five with a full head of hair, and like I'm just getting treated a right. different way by the world. Like that's the best way to describe it. So it makes you look like the the, the hundred pound gorilla in the room because yeah. no matter what your size, the fact that you have got retention.com. So, I mean, when I, when I, when I bought the domain, we, we had six people, <laughs> you know, like we've hired 20 in the last two weeks, but like this was part of the transition. And, and like, I brought this incredible company builder on who built this B2B data company called zoom info. And then a few more, one of them was called anyway, creates these billion dollar data companies. I don't know if he would have joined if part of the story wasn't, oh yeah, and I bought this huge domain retention.com that's like, you know, gonna just own the space, right? I didn't expect to have a domain name conversation at the start, but I, when I did see it, I'm like, wow, that that's a big, big it, name. It, so you you and everybody else, you know? So, yeah, <laughs> so like, yeah, and, and right. I want to qualify this by saying, so like we, long story short, a 67-year-old woman owned it as a retirement plan. Apparently- she had like agreed to this like 450 grand price or whatever. And I was like, okay, fine. Ugh. And then she slept on it and she said, NFW, like 850 <laughs> cheapest or whatever. And then I'm talking to my buddy and I'm just like, dude, like, I don't know if I can do that. almost a million dollars for this domain. Like it just seems, it, it's not, it's making me uncomfortable, you know? And he's like, okay, think about it this way. What were you comfortable paying? And I was like, well, I mean, I was anchored to this 500,000 price. Like you told me that was what it was worth and what I was going to have to pay. And 
And you told me that we were going to get a deal at 450. And so I was super excited about it. He's like, okay, so think about it this way. Is it worth 300 grand to you to not have it in a year to have it today? Because he's like, I guarantee he's you, good, this black. I guarantee you if, I go, if I go beat this woman up, we can get it for 500, but probably in 12 months, right? Like he's like, I've worked on people for three years to get domains at the price I wanted them. That's what this craft is, this domain trader trading thing. You know, we had, we have so much traction in our business. I, I was just like, that's actually, I would definitely pay 300 grand more to like have it today rather than a year from now because of everything that we have going on. Right. So, you know, we did the deal and like, I don't regret it for one second. We had a, we have a very highly positive cash flow business. Like I bootstrapped this thing to 14 million revenue with no marketing spend and six people to give you an idea. So it's a SaaS business. that's just no overhead, no office, no nothing. It's just throwing off a lot of cash. So from that perspective, it wasn't, it was like, you know, a month and a half of cash flow. It's like, whatever. Um, so, and I don't regret it. I mean, it is, it has been so amazing to have. And I'm sure it's already worth a whole lot more. Do you, have you had it valued since you bought it? I was a little bit uneasy about, as you can imagine, I've never done anything like this in my life, right? Like spending, it seems just insane to spend 800 grand on like seven letters or whatever. So, <laughs> so like I talked to this guy who I talked to before I bought it afterwards, who has, he's an advisor to a lot of companies. He's like I have arranged big names for some startups that I've, that I've been advising for. And he's like, how much you pay for it? I'm like 800 grand. He goes, I know somebody right now who would buy it for 1.5 million off of you. Like I could call him uh, up and he Adam, would pay 1.5. So I was like, Oh, great. That's <laughs> making me feel better. It's like, even if he's lying, he knows how to phrase that, you know, <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's like, even, even if he's half yeah, it's wrong, like, lie to me, baby. Just like, <laughs> now let's, let's get back on track because we are here to talk retention and it's a topic I haven't talked about on, on this show. It feels very scientific, Adam, and very complicated. What is it? Explain retention marketing to a 10 year old. Yeah. So retention marketing as it pertains to the internet and websites can mean a lot. It can mean a few different things. So the retention marketing, I think everybody in the world would agree that email marketing equals retention marketing at the most basic level. You're retaining. Well, well, ex explain that. Yes. But just explain that. Why? Be because it could also be, you say email marketing and it's also spam. Well, we can get into that. But if you think about the top of the funnel, you're showing ads on Facebook or Google or whatever. You're acquiring traffic, right? My view is down the funnel, if you capture their email address, you just retained those individuals. And then furthermore, as you continue to contact them, if you convert them to paying customers, email is the, effect, the most effective ongoing vehicle to continue to nurture the relationship and stay top of mind with your existing customers. It's the easiest way to retain and inspire repurchase, right? So SMS is now a vehicle to do that if used properly as well. A couple of questions there. I like the way this is going, but as we go, I just want to drop in a couple of questions. So uh, email is seen as the easiest way because it's pretty easy to send an email. It's pretty easy to log a few emails into an active campaign or whatever you, you're, you're so, using. So, uh, and I want to make another clarification. It's it, You don't have to buy media to if you want to say advertise to these people with email, that's what makes that people call it an owned audience because all you're paying is your active campaign subscription. You're not having to go into a platform and buy media against that audience to hit them again. Yeah. You've got them. Yeah. It's like why it's the best sort of retention thing. You said it's the easiest form and because it is easy to send an email, but is it the most effective? Cause just talk to me about people's perception of email these days. And I reckon email is great, but you know, our inboxes are full and there's, I mean, we all get a lot of crap. Um, there is an absolute um, art and science to writing, you know, a great subject line, a great email that gets opened, gets clicked on. So easy versus effective. Is email the most effective way of retaining customers? Uh, I think that it, you know, <laughs> in e-commerce, so, so somebody who is good at email would say it's the best. I could imagine a scenario in which Let's bring up a brick and mortar business that just has a website for the sake of having a website because they have to, 
they have not emphasized or staffed up digitally. They have their receptionist running their email list and they're not getting much out of it because they don't know what they're doing and it's not important to their business. I could easily imagine a scenario in which that person says email is not my best retention vehicle. They would probably say that the little card that they hand out and punch it every time that somebody buys a sandwich is a better retention vehicle, right? In terms of people who, who are very dialed in on this digital thing, I think that email is the best, you know, <laughs> it is, it is just the most, you own this list of people and you can contact them whenever you want about whatever you want. The better you are at it, the more you're going to get out of it. It's like anything in life. Back to the funnel, halfway through the funnel, you've, you've built, you've built a list, you know, they're in your bucket now. Should be like shooting fish in a bucket at this point because you've got them, you've got their email, you've potentially got their attention. How do you then use that list to retain and, in fact, um, you know, grow your bottom line? Remembering too, and I think we just need to say this, that this is as relevant to someone, a, a business that isn't e-commerce as it is an e-commerce business, as long as you've got a website, right? Is the question how somebody would use a tool like ours or is the question what are effective email strategies for people to be implementing? Right now, I'd love to drill down from effective email strategies into a tool like retention. I want to just like fork it back into someone who is a brick and mortar business and is not emphasizing the email program and then compare that to somebody who is sending, let's say, hundreds of thousands of emails every month. And this is a super important part of what they're doing because it's just very different. If you don't have an email program and you're collecting email addresses in your point of sale system, or you know, you're doing the old fishbowl, put your business card in here, even sending out a monthly newsletter with anything on it has just the power of being top of mind is something that you can't quantify, but it is a very easy and effective sort of method of doing this. I'm just in my head thinking about like, how, you know, if I'm sitting there, I'm, I already, I have five different jobs within my own business. What am I going to do? Like take another one on? Like, I, I don't know. I think there are agencies that for a reasonably low price can sort of, you know, get the content for you going for, you know, the month or whatever. And you just sort of pop it out. Your email content. Yeah, exactly. It, it's almost like the most important thing is just staying in front of people, you know, but basic principles for email that I adhere to, and this is pretty simple. Thinking back to like direct mail rules of engagement, like the list is the most important. The offer is the second most important by a long shot. The creative is the third most important by a double long shot, right? So just having an email list and keeping it engaged, <laughs> that's great. Now, when it comes to what should be on that email in terms of an offer, give somebody some kind of incentive, depending on what your business is, to come in and see you, right? Like coupons, discounts, you know, restaurants, it's like Tuesday nights, you know, whoever, like get a free cocktail. I don't know. <clears throat> I like to tell people for email, getting people to click on it is like the holy grail because then they'll come to your website and they'll see more, right? An email should only be requesting one activity out of someone. Otherwise, there's choice paralysis. What you're requesting them to do should be a huge button with a very clear call to action, <laughs> right? Redeem this coupon or like book, reserve a table tonight, like whatever it is, right? Make them do one thing and one thing only. Um, that's like a proven, if there's one button versus three different things to do, the one exception, which is not the case of the listeners here, I don't think is like, if you have a, if you're a publisher, or you're like sending out a blog summary, obviously there's going to be like several articles where people look at Groupon, something well, like that. So to that point, um, to that one action, and I'm all about, you know, one, we get them to do one thing well as opposed to try and get them to do tender and things. If you are sending an email that is a newsletter, by default, it's going to have a number of different articles or, or things. Is it still just one button to say, hey, push this button and, and read the whole newsletter on our website? I mean, it just depends on what you're trying to do. But I think there's always should be like some kind of a call to action above the fold that's the most important thing in your, in, because there's just an exponential drop off below that. So it's like, if, you know, 40% of people are going to open this email, 
literally like 70% of them are not going to make it past the fold. So like whatever you want to do, make it one thing above the fold. And then for the rest of the people that scroll down, do whatever you want to do. That, that would be my suggestion. Right. Um, and it just varies by business. So brick and mortar person, that would be what I would be doing. Sending something out once a week, whatever, like just reminding people that you exist. It's this very cheap and efficient way to do it. Before we move on, for the brick and mortar person, I'm all about story and I'm all about pool marketing, which is be super helpful to help your customers and prospects make a more informed purchase decision, right? So pool marketing is sharing helpful content. Push, obviously, is, hey, buy from me. Here's a coupon. Tuesday night, you know, steak and chips night. That seems push, push, push. Do you see a mix or do you see one as being more effective than the other? The only reason I suggest the push is because I think it's like a hundred times easier than the pull. Pull done well, there's no question it's way better. I don't know many brick and mortar entrepreneurs that are in a position to do, for instance, what Gary V did in his early wine days, right? Just sitting there recording a video every single day about different bottles of wine and ranting about the New York Jets, right? Like I'm in the process of trying to like rapidly scale this SaaS startup. I have been convinced through reading this book called Founder Brand by Dave Gerhart and several other people that I deeply respect in life that I should be creating a lot of push content myself because that's the quickest way. Given the fact that social media platforms are where the eyeballs are, People on the other side of those platforms go to those platforms to connect with people, not brands. If you want the most connection into your operation, it's got to be the fastest way is a person. You can try to get it connected to your logo in the long run, but the person is it. I'm not on these platforms in my personal life. I, I had this fear that it would be all encompassing and take it all over. I have come up with a way, uh, you know, I'm paying people, but like I have a team of, what is it? three freelancers and I spend two and a half hours on Monday morning and that turns into 18 pieces of content every week. This is for your business. For me, for me, right? So I'm just trying to provide some push inspiration, right? I'm decent on the video medium and I can crank out video very fast. What happens is these guys send me hook ideas and then for, for, for basically seven posts, I, write the bullets, I record them on video, and then send them back to them. The videos get edited by a video editor. I have a guy who takes two of the posts, one about strategy, one about philosophy. He, write, he makes them into newsletters twice a week. And then I also have a podcast, which is separate from that. All I'm trying to say is, if you decide to go the push route, there is a way to systematize. Nobody would have any idea that I'm not in there posting on LinkedIn twice a day. And writing my own newsletter. People write me back to my newsletter every week and they're like, you're a great writer. This is amazing. I'm like, I hadn't written a word of this, you know? But but like, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's my words don't, because don't I'm, I'm like, I'm like recording a video of what I want the guy to write about, right? The last time it was this great story of this guy that I share my office with, Jasper.ai, this company. It's amazing. They have this software that like writes blog posts for people. They grew from zero right. to 50 million annual recurring revenues in 12 months eight people. They just did $125 million secondary at a $1.5 billion valuation for a company that did not exist 18 months ago. It's unbelievable. Bananas. I would have told you this guy was thinking about selling his other company for like $2 million and opening a restaurant. That's where he was in 2020 at the end of 2020. Right. And then these three founders just split this thing. And now they're, you know, they're like buying houses on golf course, whatever. I look forward to you introducing me to them and they'd make my next yes. episode, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> just to go back a, a step, you, we, we're talking about now we've got a list, we've built a list, uh, in, an email list. What is, in your experience, the best lead magnet, the best way to get someone to give them to give you their email or their contact details. You're asking when you're actually getting it with the consent. Someone goes to your website. Okay, so here's, here's something that if you can't regularly do push marketing, here's what I found to be the most effective. Five quick tips, right, about 
XYZ, something like that. That's like one page, five bullets. It's like, I want it. It's super digestible. It feels like something I can get through in a matter of minutes. And, and it solves a problem that I have. So I'm willing to give my email address in exchange for it. Totally. All of the e-com stores have found that like a 15% off coupon works well for them, like the Shopify type of user. Um, I would say for other types of service businesses, a great lead, lead magnet is something that is like, just think about the problem that you're solving for the, most of your customers, right? The pain that your shop or business alleviates. Make a very small piece of content around that. Get someone to design it onto a PDF. When someone signs up on your website, have that email app, send them an email that has a link to that PDF. That will work the best. It's that whole uh, that whole little equation of high perceived value to the recipient at a low cost to the business owner. And yeah, exactly. But 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 with the asterisks that make it seem incredibly digestible would be my suggestion. Like not too much is the point. Right. Tell me if I'm getting too much into the nitty gritty here, Adam. But there are so many moving parts to what you're suggesting. So now we've got we, we've we've got a way of building our email list. We've got an email list. We've talked about push versus pull marketing. But within that, there is the need for the timing of your emails to go out. A great subject line so that people actually open the email. They then the great copy body copy of the email so that they read it and then. The holy grail, as you say, click on it because that means they're going to get to your website and they're one step away from either buying from you or, or contacting you. It's a lot of moving parts, mate. Is there any one, any, any, I mean, if we had four hours, I'm sure we could go through each one of them, but we've, you know, is there any one part that is more important than the others? The subject line is obviously incredibly important because it's your hook. I mean, just basic advertising spend 50% of your time on the hook, spend 50% of your time on the rest of it. So that's, kind of the old adage for the relative importance there. I think that this idea of, you know, the, the, whatever it is that you're, whatever action you're trying to incite for someone, that is much more important than the rest of it. Businesses are so different though. You know, <laughs> it, it just depends on what you're sending out. You know, there's, there's these businesses that are info products and they're these influencer guys and they're writing these like really long text emails that don't have a call to action at all. And, uh, you know, I don't know, but, but I think that the subject line is of the most importance in that call to action. And that big button is like the second most important. And then the rest of it's kind of like, meh. you and I probably, I mean, I, I get a lot of joy out of writing subject lines and I do, I spend a lot of time on them, but you know, for the average punter, for the average business owner, copywriting generally it's just bloody. Hard, I know. That's what I'm saying right? about this. <laughs> that's why I think push marketing is easier. It's much easier to just. <laughs> yeah, no, right. it, it's like oh, you, you already have these like discount <laughs> coupons you're sending to the newspapers or whatever, right? Yeah, it's like yeah, just, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, I think the easiest way is to get fifteen percent off. Yeah, to get your admin to just snap it with her iPhone and like put it in, a, <laughs> put it in an email and say, <laughs> "Bring this in, and we're going to give you whatever." But having said that, and if you do, and, and if even if you are going down the push marketing route. You've still got to write copy. Having a copywriter on stuff, I don't know about in your side of the world, but copywriters are pretty expensive for the average small business owner. A copywriter, you know, can be two or three hundred bucks an hour. Probably well worth the money. Do you suggest most businesses have a copywriter, not on staff, but on at least on call as a freelancer, or should a business owner do it themselves because it's coming from their their pen? Here's a hack. <laughs> we love hacks. So I mentioned these guys I share my office with. I'm not even kidding. This product, Jasper. It will write your email for you and you will be blown away. Nuts. <laughs> I'll be checking it out afterwards, man. Don't worry about that. And there are people that have e com type businesses that have A B tested what they write versus what Jasper writes for conversion. And Jasper beats them over half the time. <laughs> Doesn't beat them every time, beats them over half the time. For idea generation on what to write, you can tell this thing, you know. I have a, an entertainment company or whatever. Like I have this business and I want to write an email that will get people to do X and I want it to be 500 words and like whatever. And you hit go and it'll just produce. And then you just copy edit. You know, you sit there and like try to make it sound a little more like you. If there's samples of your writing online, you can feed it that and it will emulate your style. What? It's incredible. I mean, there's a reason these guys, 
<laughs> like are, are rich now, right? Like it's it's unbelievable. Hey, but you know the joke's on you because I reckon I reckon for Jasper.ai they paid maybe maybe twenty. Oh grand. yeah, the domain was not the story <laughs> there. Yeah, uh, it was not the story there. So they actually called it Jarvis.ai, but then Disney sent them a cease and desist because apparently there's a Jarvis character somewhere. So this technology that they built on it also does images. You can tell it create me. Uh, you know, a landscape of Myanmar. Oh, I've seen yeah. it. Yes, yes. Show me a picture of an elephant playing Monopoly. Yeah, exactly. and it'll it's do crazy. It. So, so they're all building on top of this technology called GTP3, which is the 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 the, the, pow- the group that powers it is called OpenAI. Apparently, GTP4. Have you seen the movie Her? No. So you got to watch it. It's this great movie where this guy falls in love with an operating system that like sits in his ear. It's incredible, <laughs> right? It's like set in the future, but like not that far, yeah, everything, you know, right. and everybody's walking around with these things and they all fall in love with these operating systems. And like these guys at OpenAI, like I know the, the head of sales there, they're like GTP4 is like her. Like GTP3 could already make fun of you. Dave showed it to me before they built the software. They're like, this is what we're going to mess yeah, around with. Yeah. And it would like, you'd be talking to it and it would like, you know, like it would, it would like, jab at you you know <laughs> it's crazy whoa uh anyhow man. so so Drive you i would encourage somebody i wouldn't even know where to start if i were just a business owner and not in digital marketing at all and not an email what do i even write there exists this tool now which ai has made possible that will tell you what you should write and it will work done so the problems the problems are, issue. Copyrights are going to go out of business. I mean, <laughs> well, th- their job is just change, right? It's gone from actually creating the copy to just creating a hey, hundred times more volume right. and sort of editing, right? Like that's right. Well, and they've got a new tool to use, right? It's a tool that accelerates things by multi by just exponentially. Adam, I'm super excited to get into this topic of polarization yes. <laughs> because it's another thing that you talk about. But before we do that, I don't. We're not leaving retention because there is a connection. But can we just finish the retention discussion? We've sort of, we've talked about push pull subject lines, the the content of an email, sending the the, the regu- regularity in which you send email out. Is there anything? I mean, I'm sure there's other things we can touch on, but anything big that we we just haven't touched on before we leave it? Well, yeah, uh, this mechanism that that our original tool called Get Emails uses to acquire emails is something that everyone should know about now. We only sell to a very specific type of company. It's a Shopify store that ha- that is big and, you know, uses Shopify Plus and Clavio. But there are companies, one of them is called AtData, A-T-D-A-T-A. They will sell to anyone. So if you have a website and people come and visit it, you can put this pixel on your website. And it, if the visitor visits and they don't fill out a form and they don't buy anything, for like 30, 40% of the traffic, instead of 2%, which you would get with a form, they will give you a deliverable email address and you can start an automated sequence, an active campaign or whatever that will retarget these people over email. Why is that amazing? Because of all the reasons that we talked about was retention. It's, you know, you're getting branding exposure, retargeting these people over Facebook. You have to pay for the, you have to pay for the media. You have to pay for the click, $5 a click, whatever it is. It's insane. Uh, the cost per click retargeting over an email is like next to nothing. These emails are going to be at the most, you'll pay like a quarter or something for these emails. It's a fantastic technology. You got some great case studies on your website. Can you just give us a, a quick example of a, of a client of yours that is using that and how, literally how they're using it? Sure. So, so Vital Proteins is a case study on our website. They were acquired by Nestle. They're a, a collagen brand, basically. They put it on their website. People come and visit. The people that don't buy... The people that don't give them their email address, they just start this welcome series. It sends them a coupon, you know, in the first email. The second email is like their best-selling products. The third email is their origin story, I think. All of them have discount coupons. They're trying to bring people back to certain products. But they've not opted in. Yeah, well, it's America, man. I mean, <laughs> you know, in America, <laughs> and I don't know waste. the rules in Australia. I think they may be similar. Europe, no, no. Can't do it. Canada, also a no-no. In the U.S., the can-spam law states that email is an opt-out sport, not an opt-in sport. Very contrary to popular belief. Companies like that, Active Campaign will say you cannot use emails like that on our platform. 
it's kind of up to you whether you can, right? There's no way for them to know. <laughs> you know, if they deliver well, like like Active Campaign, if you're sending emails to them over API, they have no way of knowing other than how the emails deliver, whether they were actually an opt-in from your website or not. So check out at data, A-T-D-A-T-A, if you were, don't fit into this Shopify, you know, sort of store yeah, thing. Yeah. Shopify type store, we have, you know, 10 times more power for that type of econ business than our original product, which was get emails, which you can sort of find something similar. Okay, got it. So a little plug-in gets you a whole lot more emails and starts the sequence a whole lot quicker. And people don't know it exists, which is why I was worth mentioning there. Absolutely. Um, I will need to check though what Australian laws are. I, I thought it was an opt-in sport email over here, but I could be wrong. Yeah, but everybody does in the U.S. as well, and it's not. So it's worth checking into, you know? And even actually, actually, you know what? What's more important is if Aussie people are selling to the U.S. for your U.S. traffic, yes. you're under U.S. law. You're not under your, your Aussie law for that. I know mm-hmm. for a fact because mm-hmm. we looked into this. So for Aussie brands that have U.S. web businesses, you can use something like this and it's totally fine, regardless of what the laws are in, in Australia. Let's talk polarization. What is the what is polarization and what's the connection between retention marketing and polarization? That was really this the story, you know, what we got into when I was explaining my the first name of our company was get emails. And it is really around this idea that people don't think you can send non-opt-in consumer email. So it's obviously for people who believe that you shouldn't, if you're out there saying, I have a product for brands called Get Emails, it helps people send non-first party opt-in emails. And you're screaming that, you're going to have a certain camp who hates it, who would be the recipients of the email. And you have a certain camp who loves it, who are the brands who want to make money by sending the email. (laughs) So if you just keep shouting that message really loudly, you have, you will observe a polarizing uh, thing happen um, between people who are privacy advocates and brands who just want to make money. So that's, that's kind of how it connects to, to, to my story as an entrepreneur. What are some ways of generating, you know, carefully considered controversy, you know, in order to polarize? Because you don't want to be everything to everyone. You can't be, unless you're, you know, Facebook. So this is something that worked really well for us for like six months. I don't know if it's, it's just so, every situation so different. But like this was, I did some Facebook ads when we launched. And I'm not on these platforms, but I was, it was, it was in 2020, 2020. And I was like observing people doing selfie videos of themselves and putting it on Instagram. It was like right when Instagram stories or whatever it's called. And I'm like, This is the new way people are talking to each other. They're trying to do something amusing with an interesting background. And wouldn't it be interesting if you were a brand and you were sort of doing like a minute long weekly emulation of these selfies that you're seeing everyone doing. And you actually got it to where people were anticipating these ads. Like you'd won the game, you know? My wife and I, my wife's, you know, cute kind of, she started off terrible on camera, but got to where she was actually pretty good. We were doing these videos once a week. And then I figured out that there was a vocal minority of people who were just infuriated by this idea. (laughs) Right. And I figured it out when I made a video that was like, the first thing everybody asks about get emails when they understand what it does is how is it legal? So like I went through all the, you know, reasons that we just talked about. And then, I mean, you just get these like novels about how you're the scum of the earth. I mean, really deeply insulting stuff. So from, from the brand account, I would try to insult them back personally. Like just say something (laughs) baffling, you know, like, oh my God, does your boss know that you're doing this? And I'd be like, I'm not the one with the boss. You are, (laughs) you know, like something something like that. Just like something, then they write another novel. So like, obviously this is very polarizing. And then I would make the next video like agitating the angry comments from the video before, (laughs) right? So this is a, you know, 
the, I, I think you could have called the strategy polarization. I think there's some politicians in the U.S. who have figured out that this is a way to go about, you know, because these these social machines just like they absolutely love it. You know, they love eliciting this angry, you know, discussion or whatever. It, it, it's it's a great strategy. It's a brave strategy to polarize because you know, as a business owner, you know, business is business is business, but. The minute you try to be everything to everyone, you end up being nothing to no one. And if you do polarise, if you do choose a market segment that you desperately want to appeal to, then there's a market segment just as large or maybe even bigger that you don't want to appeal to. But at least it then it informs the language you use, it informs the copy that you write, the images you use. And you can, you know, by polarising, that doesn't necessarily mean pissing people off, I don't think. But at least it says, hey, listen, we're for you, not them. This example was just the pissing people off was actually making the ad work way better. So I just kept doing it. You know, yeah, that, yeah, that wasn't it. like I was waking up in the morning thinking like, how am I going to piss these people off? Now? You know, just for the <laughs> yeah, sake of pissing them off. It's like, angry. it's like, you know, this machine, the ad gets way more distribution if like there's these people who are calling me a shit bag that I can like, <laughs> you know, sort yes. of. Work. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. But I could not agree with you more. The more narrow you go when you start, the better. It is amazing to have a tribe and enemies also in your marketing copy, right? You're drawing the line against this person or this company or like whatever. You're sort of going a, a war against them. Um, and furthermore, when you're, st- I don't believe that companies actually have brands until they're like 50 million a year in turnover. I still like, I'm, I think, I mean, I definitely didn't think I had a brand three months in when I started get emails, when I was, you know, like harassing people from the brand account. I didn't think I had a brand to destroy because nobody had ever heard us before. We have a one percent under 1% penetration into our ideal customer profile right now. in these like, I don't think I have a brand with them because awareness is not there. I think I'm in the process of building a brand. I'm doing a lot of stuff right now that if I were to act like a huge asshole, it would probably negate a lot of it. But I don't think it would be irreversible, even if I did that strategy now, given how little visibility our company has with who I'm going after, right? It could be something very different if you're like a neighborhood institution doing, you know, if you're the best restaurant in Austin, you're making 7 million bucks a year and you have a great brand. Different story. I'm just talking about like if your audience is the world, which effectively is all web companies, there's a certain size at which I really don't think you have to be concerned about your, your brand voice angering people. You know, it's like, you know what yeah, I mean? You know yeah, what I'm trying yeah, to yeah. say? It's like, it's like if you're start, if you're really early on in your journey, I, I just love doing outrageous stuff for marketing. Anyway, you have to do a pattern interrupt. Otherwise, no one's going, you know what I mean? Like, no one's going to, no one's going to see your ad. Yeah, 100%. So, so many businesses, I mean, that's music to my ears. I mean, so many businesses don't do it. I'm trying to think of a business. Oh, oh, the, 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 one of the guests that comes to mind around that is a fellow, Arthur Greeno, who owns a few Chick-fil-A franchises in the States, and he's the most hated Chick-fil-A's fran- Chick-fil-A franchisee within the franchise group because he does all this outrageous stuff like, hey, guys, we're going to get together and build the world's largest iced tea and the Guinness Book of Records are going to be at the front to formalize that. Yeah, this is like classic sort of, you know, my life in advertising. You ever read that book? <laughs> he he <laughs> yeah, literally did that in the 20s with a cake, right? <laughs> like this is, how are you going to, yeah. But it's great stuff and it's brave stuff. And, you know, I come from an advertising background and we've we've touched on the the concept of having an idea of actually being creative in your marketing. And for many business, for most business owners, this is a really tough area. 100%. So it's all very well, you know, and, and it's an area that should be encouraged because we live in a world of parity. We live in a world of sameness. There's no shortage of accountants. There's no shortage of, you know, washing detergents. There's no shortage. There's a lot of everything. So how do you stand out? And one way is to do some crazy stuff, whether it be guerrilla marketing or what, what's your process for that, Adam, within within retention? Is it, do you have a meeting once a month and go, how can we be crazy? Are you in the shower and just having these <laughs> light bulb moments? So I will qualify this by saying 
I'm the only one who acts on this. Everybody, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, so, we so, so there was that six month period when we were doing these Facebook ads. They were working incredibly well from a ROAS perspective, meaning, and basically how it would work is like a bunch of people who were too small for us to make money on and churned at an unbelievably high rate would sign up. And then one perfect customer would come along who was huge and stick around and they'd pay all the ads back for the prior two weeks, right? That's great for spreading awareness. That's not great for building a subscription business because you just have to go to the lowest churn. You know what I mean? It, Facebook was not, it's not the place we should be fishing for our audience. It's more kind of like, you know, I, I don't know, but doing Facebook ads is not it. So, um, that was what, and, and I didn't know I had this, this like talent or gift or whatever. It, it just sort of week by week, I, I just realized I really had a knack for it. I could like come up with stuff that would, would make people laugh at the same time as interesting visually at the same time it pissed this one group of people off. And it was just this perfect combination of stuff. And I could write the script in 15 minutes and just record it, you know, but I should give you a link. I'm going to give you a link to these videos. They're outrageous. One of them, like after the, the this like uh, PPP, the 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 loan that Donald Trump gave all the small businesses during COVID, the Paycheck Protection Program. Like I dressed up as Donald Trump, painted my face all orange. You know, my my wife now is Melania. Like I, I said, it's a great get emails giveaway, and I was trying to like do a freemium thing or whatever. She's like spraying bleach in my mouth during it. You know. <laughs> It's just like so ridiculous. Like I had this ridiculous wig and my hair's hanging out of the bottom of it, you know, like just, just yeah, really yeah. good stuff. And like, I haven't done anything like that in a long time. We just, I just worked with this guy who I met at a mastermind. We actually recorded maybe last week, maybe the week before, I think it was the week before. And like, he thinks in terms of pattern interrupt and it, he had an amazing pro He had me burning hundred dollar bills in front of the camera, like starting a YouTube ad with me holding a burning hundred dollar bill. Right. And like, you know, my wife runs in, she's like, what are you doing? I'm like running Facebook ads. Like, and that's like the hook, <laughs> you know, yeah. like what's it look yeah, like? No, that's the hook. Right. And Tell me about just the Donald Trump uh, idea. I mean, it's very funny. I love that it's creative. Have you immediately pissed off every re possible Republican? Uh, yeah, I was getting comments. All the, I was getting comments, you know, left <laughs> and right. Like, Oh, you're disgracing. I'm like, come on, man. Like, look at it. Clearly I like, and, and, and this is like a Saturday Night Live skit. Give me a break, you know? Like, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> how did you measure its success? Did you get, do you know how much business you got from? I would say that the, the ad campaign was enormously successful in that it created an, an initial layer of aware, like a huge awareness for our company that did not exist the day before I was doing the ads. That campaign, that ad in particular that we're talking about, I deeply respect this company called MailChimp because I used to compete with them. And I think they're the most incredible company ever. They've since been acquired, but like how they, I watched them destroy every competitor in that market aside from like Clavio and Active Campaign. Constant Contact was the pioneer. They destroyed Constant Contact. <laughs> like, Clavio latched onto the Shopify system, had MailChimp not had a public breakup with, with, with Shopify, I don't know, may, maybe they wouldn't have such a leadership system. I think MailChimp's success to me as an outsider was the fact that it had a great user interface and it felt very, it made something that is very complicated, i.e. email marketing, it, it seemed achievable and accessible and friendly. But the real power move was they made it free for 90% of the users of the market, <laughs> right? And, and Constant Contact that was helps. publicly traded and they literally couldn't do it. They couldn't do it. So like they had this amazing, it was, it was a play to destroy Constant Contact. It wasn't a play to beat them by a little bit. It was a play to absolutely crush them, you know? So I had this dream of like having a freemium product. And the problem with this product as freemium is people will sign up for something that's free and they don't even know what it is. Right. So like kind of like, and, and you're running ads and you're paying for users acquisitions, right? So paying a hundred bucks a user for someone who a lot of times didn't even know what it was. A lot of times they'd get, so like getting, getting them to put the script on their site for a free product is very difficult. It just was hard, you know? And then if they got their script on the site with a free offer, it's like most of them didn't have traffic. And we need traffic for resolution. So like that particular thing 
it just, and, and I was like, okay, so we can sit here and try to optimize this freemium offer. But like, we know that the people who pay us $5,000 a month are where the money is. Why don't we figure out how to make them a better product and then go find more of them? So like, what I'm saying is that ad in particular didn't work, but like the sequence of ads on Facebook, it was enormously successful for the, for the, for, you know, when and how it was, it just facilitated every sales call. Cause people had all seen them in this market. You know, we were just pounding Shopify interest group or whatever. Adam, it's a big topic, which it, it sort of deserves more time, but obviously, and maybe we can do that another time. Is there anything left unsaid that, you know, just top of mind? I wouldn't normally, it's the interview, it's the worst question an interviewer can actually ever ask. And you're a podcaster yourself, so you know this, but, you know, it, it just from, from a small business owner's point of view who are listening, is there any sort of left, anything left unsaid around the whole topic of email marketing or polarization? You think, hey, just drive one last point home. I mean, the day that I embraced, try to be as different as possible, everything changed for me. <laughs> Love it. You know, like you kind of said it be, yourself. Be it's different. like, everybody's trying to copy everybody else. Like liquid death. Do you guys have that over there in Australia? There's this water no. brand here that like recently got like a billion dollar valuation <laughs> that started, you know, two years ago or something like that. So like every water brand is trying to compete on how pure their water is. This very smart brand guy showed up with a metal can of water that is called liquid death, death in a can. And that's how they're selling water, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and like everybody thinks it's hilarious. It's the most different thing yeah. in the water aisle that exists. It's a metal can. And instead of saying it will help you, it's saying it will kill you. And it's just prolific, you know, like it is as hard the other ways you could possibly go, right? Like. I'm not saying do that, but like try to do that, right? Like if there's five guys doing one thing, try to do the dead opposite. Hey, Adam, thoroughly enjoyed chatting to you, mate. Really interesting conversation. One that, you know, we, I should have done many, many months ago. Retention.com is where you'll find Adam. And he's very happy to, you know, can talk about selling you that domain for a pretty price. <laughs> <laughs> there's lots of stories. Thanks, brother. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me on. Well, there you go, team. Retention expert and purveyor of fine domain names, Adam Robinson of retention.com. 800,000 US dollars for a word with .com on the end. Sort of seems crazy. That said, if you've got the cash flow and you can justify it, then why the hell not? And I certainly couldn't argue with, you know, his, you know, reasons for buying it. And hey, it's already almost doubled in value. Good on him. Hopefully there was enough inspiration in that chat with Adam for you to get on top of your email marketing and start to use it as the asset it should be. You'll find links to other in-depth chats I've had around email marketing over the years over at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com forward slash 616. Oh, and if you're wondering, I have already reached out to the owner of Liquid Death and the owner of Jasper.ai for an interview. Fingers crossed both of them come off because they both look like amazing businesses and brands to hear from. Hey, if you're already successfully building an email list off your website and using it effectively, then let us all know what you're doing by calling the Small Business Big Marketing Hotline on 0480 015 150. What are you giving away in exchange for an email address? How are you using your list to get more business? And be sure to include your website address so we can all sign up. Hey. Got to help you guys along. That's why we're here. 0480-015-150. Leave me a message now. Timbo, thanks for the opportunity. Linda Sullivan from Night Ollie, Children's Bedwetting Solution is my name. Uh, yes, a niche uh, market for sure. So I usually listen to your podcast on my walks. So sometimes life gets in the way of taking action when I get home. And today I kept stopping, kept taking notes, and here I am taking action of calling you uh, to say how fantastic the podcasts are. I just listened to John Fortress uh, of The Fortress, and of course, not my demographic at all, but always gold and the courage that it takes for somebody to uh, get something like that up. Uh, the action is biggest takeaway for me is one step every day uh, to to the goal. So 
thank you again for the opportunity. Linda Sullivan, Night Ollie, Children's Bed Wedding Solution. Bye for now. Hey, Linda, thank you so much for taking the time to call. Now, whilst I'm biased, I do concur with you, no matter who I'm interviewing and what topic I'm covering, my intention with this podcast is always that you, my precious listener, walk away with an insight, an idea, or a kick in the pants to move that beautiful business of yours along the path of growth. And I also believe the same principle applies when looking for like you know, a graphic designer or a web designer or a copywriter for your business. Look outside your industry because that's where the new ideas are. If you're always looking inside your industry, you're sort of not going to break free from what your industry is already doing from a marketing perspective. So sometimes it's good to look outside. Hey, everyone else, be like Linda and call me on 0480-015-150. Put that in your phone under Timbo. Call me anytime, leave a message. Uh, And let us know what marketing is working for you at the moment. Love to hear from you. Got some great guests coming your way in the coming weeks. You'll hear from the Today Show's Chief of Staff, who's going to explain how you can get yourself and your business on telly, on the box. Australia's leading expert on chatbots is going to show how small businesses just like yours are using them to save money and to grow. That technology's come a long way. And yes, I will explain that all my experiences with chatbots have been totally frustrating. But hey, let's get the elephant in the room out of the way, right? If there's a business owner you'd love me to chat with, email me, tim at timreid.com.au, and I'll chase them down if I think it would make for a good chat. If you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to hit the subscribe button on your favorite podcast app where you'll find 615 more chats with successful business founders. This show was stitched together by editor extraordinaire Alex Amster. Thank you, Alex. And the music bed written, sung, produced by our in-house rock star, Lockie Dolly. Most importantly, thank you to you for tuning in. May your marketing be the absolute best marketing. Bye for now.